But it's great to be here with you this morning. Uh, those that are here present or online, I just really appreciate Pastor Yen's invitation to come speak to you about this topic. I want to talk to you this morning about justice for just us, of course, with a question mark, um, how to do justice in the public square. Now, I understand that Attorney Jeff Loxton was preaching last week and that there have been a number of attorney jokes going around. It's just that those are always effective. Um, so I won't tell you an attorney joke, but I will tell you um, an attorney story. Uh, so when I was uh, sworn in to practice law in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I was standing there in the courtroom. Um, I think we have a picture of the courtroom. It looks regal, oak adorned. It symbolizes the power and authority of the Kentucky Supreme Court. Uh, so I was standing there trying to take the solemn oath to become an attorney, and I was trying not to smile or crack up. I was trying to keep a straight face. You may say, well, why, why was that a problem? It sounds kind of like a solemn issue. Um, but the reason why is because part of the oath in Kentucky to become an attorney or an elected official is this. I do further solemnly swear or affirm that I have not fought a duel with deadly weapons within this state nor out of it, nor have I sent or accepted a challenge to fight a duel with deadly weapons, nor have I acted as a second in carrying a challenge, so help me God. So as a follower of Jesus, I admit to you that there are some things that I wrestle with, uh, trying to be more holy and more like Christ, but I'll admit to you that one thing I have never struggled with is fighting a duel with a deadly weapon. It just has never kind of come across my radar. Um, and my friends have asked me some really weird things throughout my life, uh, but I've never had somebody come up to me and say, hey, Josh, I'm dueling that dishonorable scoundrel down by the steamboat landing tomorrow. Will you be my second? I've just never had anybody ask that. And so I was wondering, why is this in not just this oath, but actually in the Kentucky Constitution? And it brought up the habit or practice of dueling. So in Europe, the practice of dueling was basically employed to settle kind of romantic feuds. But in the United States, it became a practice of settling political differences. And specifically when one politician would say something mean to another and besmirch their honor. Uh, for example, Alexander Hamilton died in a duel. So did his son. So at some point, the people of Kentucky got together and said, you know what, dueling's dumb. Like, we've put this practice of solving political differences kind of on autopilot for a long time, and this is just kind of our culture of how we settle political differences. But some of our best leaders are literally going out and shooting one another. All right, and so this is just dumb, and we're going to bring an end to it. So when I think about dueling and that, that habit, I also think about us as Christians and how we kind of live out our faith in public life, how we might, what we might call our citizenship, how we practice that. And I think right now is a really important time for us as Christians to kind of step back and say, you know, that probably shouldn't be on autopilot uh, because we shouldn't be practicing citizenship like everyone else. Like every area of our lives, we're supposed to be bringing that in accord with Scripture. And so today, that's really what I want to talk to you about. The big idea uh, this morning is that God's justice, or kingdom of God's justice, doesn't just apply here in the pew, but also in the public square. But then, of course, that raises a great question, the, the billion-dollar question, which is a million-dollar question adjusted for inflation. The, the billion-dollar question is, well, okay, uh, I, I give you that principle, but how exactly am I supposed to do that? in an increasingly diverse and divisive post-Christian society. And so today I want to give you some practical ideas, kind of a checklist of sorts, of how you can actually do justice in the public square. And you may be asking, well, why, Josh, are you the one um, speaking about this? And that's a, a great question. Uh, I lead the Daniel Initiative, which is a new initiative here in the state of Indiana. And our goal is to build relationships between the ministers of God and the ministers of government, uh, elected officials, with the goal of ministering to them, but also partnering with them for the common good. And our ultimate goal really is to see our cities and our states transformed through the power of the gospel. So I'll tell you, I don't always get it right, and I don't have all of the answers, but I have some ideas, and I'm doing my very best every day to try to live out the gospel in this particular arena. God's called some of you into healthcare, into education. This is where God's called me, and I'm doing my very best to engage government in God's way. So I want to bring that perspective to you this morning. Let's jump right in. Uh, turn with me to Amos chapter number 5. Amos chapter number 5 and verse number 10 is where we'll start. You can turn there in your Bible or your Bible app. As you're turning there, um, Amos fascinates me because Amos was not a Levite uh, trained in the ways of being a priest, nor was he a king. He was just a run-of-the-mill shepherd that God called to pronounce judgment upon several nations. And what's interesting, he starts the book 
an inspiration, of course, of God. He starts the book by talking about judgment on foreign nations. And you can imagine the Jews are like, yeah, go get them, those heathen pagan people. Yeah, they need judgment. And then he turns to the children of Israel. Oh boy. And that's what we find in chapter number five. In verse number 10, Amos says, they hate him, speaking of the Jews, that rebukes in the gate. And they abhor him that speaks uprightly. If you've studied the Old Testament, you know that the gate wasn't just a place where you entered a city. And if you think back to the story of Ruth, where Boaz goes to become the kinsman redeemer, all of the life, the kind of politics, uh, the, the judgment that happened in a city in the Old Testament happened in the gates. So when Amos says, they hate him that rebukes or speaks truth in the gate, they abhor him that speaks uprightly. He's talking about the public life of the city. In verse number 11, for as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, and you take from him burdens of wheat, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold are many transgressions and your mighty sins. Look at the types of sins that he's about to describe. These are the sins um, that are bringing judgment upon the children of Israel. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. They turn aside from the poor and the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. And then here's the command from God. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have spoken. Verse 15, hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. And whenever I have the, the opportunity to meet with elected officials, I've had the honor of having uh, Pastor Yet up at the State House this session to meet with your senator. Uh, we always want to start those meetings with scripture. We're, we're Christians. We're coming in there. We're we're sharing the word of God with them and had the opportunity to share this passage of scripture with our attorney general. Uh, there's a lot of elements in here. He's in charge of consumer protection, uh, pursuing criminal appeals, and so many relevant things that address him. Look with me in, in verse number 21. And a couple weeks ago, Pastor Yetton was talking about the same principle we find in Isaiah 58. This is God speaking. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take you away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vials. And so the same principle that Pastor was talking about. Certainly God wants us to worship him by song and to bring to him offerings. But he says, if you're doing that, but you're not doing justice, I don't want it. I hate it because it, it's hollow. It's actually not doing justice. And so he says, I hate all of those things. Instead, I want you to do this. He says in verse number 24, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. You may recognize that phrase. It was made famous by Martin Luther King Jr. And I love that concept of this mighty stream kind of sweeping down a mountain, cleansing all before it. And so what do we learn from Amos? Amos chapter number five, it's very simple. What he's saying is that justice, God's justice, kingdom of God's justice, doesn't just apply in the synagogue, doesn't just apply in your own private walk with God. It should apply in the public life of a city. So that's the message from Amos. You think, well, that's just the children of Israel. That doesn't apply to everybody. But if you look in Daniel chapter number four and verse number 27, Daniel talks to a foreign king and tells him to break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Also, consult the first couple of chapters of Amos where he's speaking about other nations. Moving to the New Testament, why did John the Baptist lose his head? Was he talking to Herod about eternal salvation? No, he challenged him saying, you're living in adultery. And this really ticked off Herodias and, and caused John to lose his life. And then, of course, we want to look at the example of Jesus. And certainly Jesus spent most of his time talking about spiritual regeneration, about coming into a relationship with him. But notice what he did, and notice what he talked about while he was here on earth. He had many things to say about many things. For example, he addressed proper taxation, poverty, power, marriage laws and family structure, unbiblical racial pride, religious hypocrisy, and unbalanced Sabbath regulations. And then he also, just through what he did, he critiqued unbiblical social mores. For example, he ate a meal with a publican. He ministered to a Samaritan woman. 
He cleansed the temple, and he spent most of his time with a ragtag set of disciples rather than with righteous or with the righteous rulers of the day or with kings. And so Jesus himself was an example of certainly preaching the good news, but also engaging in good works. And that's what we see in Matthew 5, 16, that the good news and good works go together to show the power and the beauty of the gospel. And so the conclusion that I take from this is that we are called to do justice in every area of our lives, including in our role as a citizen, and including in the public square. I know that that can sound a bit controversial, so let me give you a modern day example of this and why it is so important. We're gonna show you a picture of the, of the actual jail cell where Martin Luther King Jr. was housed while he was in Birmingham. He was there uh, to protest, protest racial injustice, and famous Bull Connor had him thrown in a jail cell. So while he's in the jail cell, it's nothing like kicking you while you're down, he gets a communication from white pastors in Birmingham, basically taking him to task. And this was the quote um, that sticks out to me from his letter. He says, in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I've heard many ministers say these are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. So what were those pastors saying? They're saying, look, this racial injustice stuff that's gone on for now almost 400 years in our country, that it's not a big deal. And let's just get back to preaching the gospel. I encourage you today to give you just a little bit of homework, to go read his letter from a Birmingham jail. He can make this point much more eloquently and forcefully than I do about justice applying in the public square. It's just an incredible letter. This is one part I picked out that makes the point. He says, the early Christians rejoiced in response to these pastors when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. And so how many times have we as the church heard that, well, you Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. You go to church on Sunday and you talk about what's right and what's true, but when you get outside the walls of your church, you don't make a difference. How many times have we heard that? And we can point to things like slavery or discrimination. And so just as Scripture tells us about the salt and light, if we're not salt, it gets spewed out of people's mouths. So I kind of summarize this point this way. If justice sits, just sits in a pew, it causes the world to say P-U, like it stinks, okay? And if, we, if justice just sits in a pew, it causes the world to say P-U. We want people to look at our works and say, wow, the gospel's amazing, it changes lives. And a private justice that we just keep in here does not do that. And so that's the first point. It's not just justice for us. It's justice for all people, and we're supposed to be living it out in every area of our lives. So if we're supposed to do that, then there's a, a big question, because we live in a plural society. Well, whose justice should— okay, we're supposed to promote justice. Well, whose justice should we be promoting? Because there's a, a lot of competing views out there, right? And so there's a great passage in Matthew 22 where the, the Jews come to Jesus and say, do we— really have to pay taxes to the Romans? Uh, we don't like these people, so do we really have to pay taxes to them? And I'm sure you know this verse. Jesus responds to them, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, render to God that which is God's. And it's important to know what he was looking at. They handed him a coin, right? Well, he's looking at the Roman denarius, and on the front of the coin was an image of Caesar, symbolizing political authority. But on the back of the coin was a picture of Caesar's mother with the phrase, highest priest. And this was a claim to spiritual authority. So what was Jesus saying? Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. General civil obedience, don't commit criminal acts. But then render to God that which is God. So what does God desire of us, require of us? He requires us of us our ultimate allegiance and worship. So when we look in Scripture at the role of government, when it's supposed to punish the evildoer, whose definition of evil applies there? Well, as Christians, we can say, well, God's, right? God's definition of justice applies. So whose version of justice, definition of justice, applies in the public square? I would argue that it is God's justice. That seems fairly simple for us as Christians. Um, I've heard that word justice thrown out around a lot, and I'm not sure if you've watched the History Channel at all as of late. Um, I saw this meme 
like justice um, in that idea, like history, if you've watched the History Channel, I don't think that word means what you think it means, all right? Because they have lots of reality shows anymore. It's just like, there's no history, all right? And so when we talk about justice, sometimes I'm scratching my head like, yeah, I don't think that was God's idea of that. Well, why would this be important, not just for us, but for all people? And I'll say this, that our favorite color in the United States these days is gray. Why? Because we're, we're encouraged to just follow our own truth, right? You, you get to decide what's right and wrong for you, and you get to live that out in your life, and that's fulfillment. And anybody that speaks against, that's just being oppressive. But you know there's one area in our public life where that's no, that is still not the case. Have you ever looked at a judge's robe? Is it an ambiguous gray? <laughs> no, it's jet black. And when I first started practicing, I tell you my kind of justice meter went haywire because I saw so many young kids, young adults I might say, 18, 19, 20, that were being convicted of crimes and pleading guilty to crimes. And they, I kept hearing them talking to each other like, I've been told my whole life I get to do whatever I want, I get to define what's right and wrong, and I get to live out my own truth. And now I'm, I'm actually going to jail for it. So you see, our, our society, we kind of act like there's no truth, but you can't actually run a society that way, and we don't run our society th that way. If your compass, your moral compass, is always pointing straight back at you, it's really hard <laughs> to determine what's right and wrong. And especially as we head into an increasingly complex era, we need a strong, robust sense of what is right and wrong. Well, which institution is responsible for that? It's the church. Taking God's word, saying, here's what's true, and here's what's false. That's what our society needs these days. I was thinking about, you know, what moral consensus do we have right now? I think the moral consensus, this is all we've got with relativism. All right, number one, you can hate Nazis, that's okay. And then number two, you can love puppies. All right, that's all we've got. Anything beyond that's controversial. And so we certainly need something stronger than that. And to kind of bring all of this point together, I would summarize it this way. Caesar's job is to administer justice, or government's job is to administer justice, not to define justice. God has defined justice, and we should live that out in the public square. So let's get practical here. And I'll try to move through this pretty quickly. So the third point is to be judgmental. All right, so one of the kind of mantras in American life is don't judge me. All right, don't judge me. Everybody knows that verse. Like, and anybody says anything moral, it's like, oh, you're judging me. Um, so I, I was thinking about something else that's very American um, that I love. And so I came across this quote recently about a cowboy here. With the rise of self-driving vehicles, it's only a matter of time until there's a country song where a guy's truck leaves him, okay? And so you, you got to love American stuff, all right? But sometimes we need to rethink things. Um, and so this is one of those. Matthew 7, 1 through 3 says, Judge not that you be not judged. But in John 7, 24, Scripture reminds us, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And so as Christians, of course we're supposed to apply justice we're just not supposed to do it in this legalistic, um, judgmental way that, that focuses on, oh, I'm rich and you're poor, and so I'm better than you. And so we need to, to actually pull in the entire context of that. So how can we, as Christians, do justice in the public square? I've got four quick steps for you uh, that I, I wanted to go through, and we're trying to live this out through the Daniel Initiative. First is to kind of go over your citizenship, meaning review it, kind of renew our mind, and we've been talking a little bit about that this morning. The second one would be to pray for and build relationships with your elected officials. I know nobody's looking at that saying, wow, Sherlock, I've never thought about that before. No, it's just hard work. And it's hard to scream at somebody when you've had actually a conversation with them and you've realized they're a human being. So here's a quick test for you this morning. Uh, I didn't know that you'd have a quiz. But uh, in your first interaction with your elected officials, you should, number one, scream at them while denouncing their heathen ways, all right? Number two, ask them for special privileges, like a street named after your dearly departed pet parakeet. Notice I did not say dog or cat because that'd be a little too close to home. Um, or third, ask them how you can pray and help. The second point that I, or the, the third point that I'd make to you and encourage you to think about is to look at your community's worst problems. And we often ask elected officials, what's the worst problem in your district? And how can we help with that? 
And I'll get into some specific examples we're working on. And then the fourth one is to engage in public life with a focus on the gospel. So of course I want you to talk about what's true, right, and beautiful on social media. But I want you to do that as a follower of Jesus and not somebody just screaming at other people. Of course I want you to engage in public, what we might call like public policy, or the ways that we say we deal with foster care, those sorts of things. And I've noticed um, kind of this intriguing fact. The foundation of the church's public witness is a simple fact. All people are created in the image of God, and therefore they're of equal dignity and respect, or worthy of equal dignity and respect. That certainly encourages us to pursue racial justice, right? But it also encourages us to pursue protections for the unborn. And see, one of those issues sounds very conservative, and one of those issues sounds very liberal, but both of them are biblical. And so when we talk about engaging in public life with a, a focus on the gospel, it tells us to elevate the fact that we're a follower of Jesus over our socio-political tribe. So let me jump into some examples of how we're trying to do this in public life. Um, so our, our project, so the Capital Project, connecting pastors and elected officials. Um, we also have an effort where we have the Do Good Project, trying to work on these tough problems in our communities. And then the Good Citizen Project, we're trying to help the church engage government in God's way. And so over the last couple of, couple of months, we've had an opportunity to, to connect about 40 pastors to come around our U.S. Senator, Todd Young, um, and had a great uh, time to pray with him. I asked the pastors just to list what they're doing in their communities. Uh, this blew me away, and it certainly blew Senator Young away. Um, he took to Twitter to talk about it. We've also uh, connected with 52 different legislators at the State House, and here's a picture of a group of pastors from Fort Wayne uh, praying with their senator. Now, if you do not know who your legislators are, and I know you have a life, all right? You've got a lot of other things going on. Uh, well, who's my house rep and who's my U.S. senator? You can actually just Google Indiana, find your legislator. You can plug in your address, and it will kick these names out, and you can begin to pray for them and look to build relationships with them. When I asked our governor, Governor Holcomb, what are some ways that the church can help in the state of Indiana to solve tough problems and seek the common good, he just racked off three quick things. Foster care, the drug crisis, jail rehabilitation, meaning people coming out of jail as a returning citizen, helping them get back into life. And so we've been working on these. Uh, during COVID-19, we set up a, a website to help connect elected officials and churches to solve problems. Here's a picture of Senator Andy Zay, just to make sure we've got the right one up here, um, he passed something called the CARE Portal, which allows churches to respond to a request from the Department of Child Services when there's a poverty-based neglect situation, provide some just very tangible stuff, like a mattress, like clothing, and keep kids out of foster care. Um, as the time of this picture, I'm sure the numbers are much higher, that already kept something like 150 kids out of foster care. Later this fall, we'll be involved in the AG's annual drug abuse symposium. Uh, they've allowed us to put together kind of a faith-based session or breakout. We're going to be talking to judges and lawmakers and those in social services about the great work that many ministries around the state are doing to help engage the drug crisis. And of course, after George Floyd's death, etc., uh, we've been doing a lot of work on racial justice, racial reconciliation, and we're, we're putting together a group of pastors uh, diverse pastors in Indy, trying to think through how can we come together on one voice and make a difference in that city. When I think about doing justice in the public square, certainly a, a key example of this is Martin Luther King Jr. And I, I have to admit you, I had never deeply read some of his kind of spiritual journey. I had read a lot of his public events and, and speeches, but I came across a story I just wanted to, to share with you. I thought that was so powerful. And one of the key things about MLK's story is just how quickly he went from basically obscurity to leading a national movement. Rosa Parks was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama on December 1st, 1955. By January 26th, so this is less than two months, MLK is 26 years old. He was leading a church. He has a young wife. He has a young daughter. And he's now become the national leader of the Montgomery bus boycott. He'd already had his life threatened, and he was tired. He had just been arrested the day before, spent time in jail, the very first time in his whole life on a trumped-up trump traffic charge, basically getting him to try to stand down from this boycott. So he's thrown in jail for an entire night. He finally gets out. He goes to a meeting, and he, come ho he comes home late at night. 
And in the speech that he's telling this story, he says, look, I'm, I'm, I was tired. I'm starting to get concerned about my family, worried about their safety. And around midnight, he gets a phone call. And it, the phone call begins with a racial slur, but then goes on to say, we are tired of you and your mess now, and if you aren't out of this town in three days, and I'm just telling you what this caller said, we're going to blow your brains out and blow up your house. Click. And so M.O.K. sat down at his table, and he, would, he told this story many times later in his life, and he said, I'm, I'm done. I, I just don't think that I'm supposed to be doing this anymore. And he recorded his prayer, Lord, I'm trying to do the right thing. I think I'm right, I think the cause that we represent is right, but Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering, I'm losing my courage, and I can't let the people see me like this because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. So this was a, a critical moment in MLK's ministry where he was ready to quit, and who could blame him? But he tells of, he tells of this moment with God. He had a meeting with God, and so he's, while he's sitting there at this table with a, an unfinished cup of coffee, this is what he says. It seems at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you even unto the end of the world. He said, I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still to fight on, he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. And from that point forward, MLK never looked back. His house was bombed three days later. He was later stabbed in the chest, eventually killed by an assassin's bullet. But he never looked back because he heard Jesus telling him, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you even unto the end of the world. You know, what Martin Luther was saying, uh, what Martin Luther King Jr. said, what Jesus told him, reflects Amos chapter number five and reflects scripture. So this morning, my encouragement to you is it's just to insert your name there. And this may sound like, oh, you're telling us to go do something great. No, I'm telling you, in your sphere of influence, God's telling us, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And though I'll be with you even unto the end of the world. Many times I hear, well, it's just too complex. It's just too difficult out there. No, I, I think actually we take these principles and we live them out despite the pressure from varying forces in our society. And we do so no matter the cost. And so if you would insert your name there, whether it's Josh or it's Steve or your name, stand up for righteous, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and though I'll be with you. And so I encourage you to go do justice in your sphere of influence. I always try to bring what I say and kind of wrap it down into one phrase or statement that hopefully kind of help you remember and implement it in your life. And so most of us are familiar with the Pledge of Allegiance in the United States, and that's become increasingly controversial in uh, recent days, but you know the words. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty. And what's that last phrase? And justice for all. And certainly this is aspirational. We, we've never had justice for all, and we may never have it. It just doesn't, doesn't mean we stop trying. This is an aspirational statement. But how many times have we sat in a classroom or at an event, and we just kind of mouthed the words of the pledge, and it just kind of went through our mouth, but we never really thought about it or made it a pledge, something we're actually going to do. So my encouragement to you today is just this phrase, let's turn the pledge into a practice. Justice for all. That's what scripture commands us to do. And with God's grace, God's courage, we can do that in our times.